Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, let us, first of all, as we enter into this next uh, phase of the service, let's take a, a look at uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, I think it was interesting when I asked Pastor Larry to come up and, and make the declaration of who the Lord was to him, how he began to testify about the two things that he learned first that made it so um, easy for him to continue in his walk with the Lord, and it was walking in love and forgiveness. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, developing and becoming skilled in the love of God. And what I want to look at first here in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9, I want us to see instructions to the New Testament believer. But you and I, we are going to receive these as our instructions because these are things specifically directed towards us. He says, and, I, and this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, and that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Notice it begins with our love abounding more and more. Our love abounding more and more in knowledge and in judgment. And as our love abounds, this will cause us to be able to approve things which are excellent. To be able to say, that's the right thing for me. That's the right action to take. That's the right attitude to have. I can approve things that are excellent. Why? Because my love is abounding more and more. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Colossians 3. We're going to read 12 through 14. Put on therefore... This is an instruction for this is something we are going to be actively putting on. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness. Let's say hearts because, you know, that was very old English. You know, we, we love each other from the bottom of our heart, but they loved each other with their bowels. So let's go, let's, let's love each other with all of our heart, okay? We'll update King James. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, hearts of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love. This word charity is the word love, the God kind of love. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of completeness. When we see perfectness, we want to recognize it's talking about maturity it's talking about being developed. It's talking about a completion of an action, a process. And so love is the bond of maturity. Love is the completeness. Love is the sign that I have grown up in Christ. Love is the sign that I am a mature. And it's specific, it, it's talking about loving brothers and sisters in Christ, which is the emphasis of the New Testament. We are to walk in love with everyone. But we have even a, 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 an emphasis placed in the New Testament on loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because you've got to live with me for the rest of eternity. I have to live with you for the rest of eternity. And love is going to govern us there just like it's supposed to govern us here. We get to practice here. We get to practice our love walk here because it's going to be something we're going to be involved in for eternity. Amen? And so he says, put this on. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond or the, uh, uh, the uh, recognition of maturity. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. 
It says, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. Now that's the second time we've seen a verse that connects how we love to our holiness. Amen. That as we grow in love, we're going to walk in holiness. Hallelujah. And so it says here, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Notice again that this is an increase and an abounding in love one toward another. So where we are today, every one of us, we should have a goal that by the end of this year, we are farther along in our love walk. Every year. We've got to set that goal. That should be at the top of the vision list. Every year I need to be better at walking in love than I was at the beginning of the year. I need to grow in this. I need to be mastering 1 Corinthians 13. I need to take 1 Corinthians 13 and build it into my spirit until it is an automatic response. An automatic response. When somebody is plucking my last nerve, that last nerve has been covered up by 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I am so not easily offended. Amen? <laughs> I, I've just got 1 Corinthians 13 working. I don't even vaunt myself. I'm not looking to have my own way. I don't even get my attitude on and say, oh, no, you don't. No, I, 1 Corinthians 13 is at work in my life. Amen? That's, that's, uh, that's our aim. That's our goal. We want to abound. We want to be abounding in love. We want to be increasing in love. Do you see this? In chapter 4, verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians, it says this, But as touching brotherly love, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So this is something that if we are submitting to what the Holy Spirit is dealing with us about on our personal basis, He is always going to be dealing with us about our love walk. He's always going to be helping us improve our love walk. He's always, it's always going to be on the, the uh, class for the day. The Holy Spirit's always got Love 101 ready to pull out and say, hey, we need to do our love lesson today. Uh, we need to work on that love growth, that love walk today. Amen? Amen. And then it says, uh, in, in, uh, do I want, yeah, I want 10. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in Mas all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. What's he talking about? Increasing in love. He said, I know I don't need to write to you about love. The Holy Spirit, the Lord's been dealing with you and teaching you how to love, and you love everybody, but I'm, I'm, I'm beseeching. Beseech is a strong begging word. I am getting down on my knees, and I am seriously telling you we need to increase in this. I am seriously requesting of you. I am begging of you. I am pleading with you. Let's increase in love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And faith builders. Hear your pastor's heart tonight. I am pleading with you. Let's increase in love. Let's increase in love. Let's increase in the love of God. One for another. For God, first of all, and then for each other. Amen? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It is the, the key to our growth. It's the key to our peace. It's the key to our life. Love is the way to victory. Love never fails. First, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound, got a preacher on the front row. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly. We, we shout at that verse, don't we? We like that, faith growing exceedingly. We all want that. Your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all towards each other abounds. That's, those are connected. You can't separate the faith exceedingly growing and the love abounding. You can't say, well, I want the faith to grow, but I'm not willing to, to increase in love. No, they're connected. 
because faith works by love. Love is the, the power supply. Faith is love dependent. Just like this keyboard is electricity dependent. It's not going to work without electricity. And faith won't work without love. Faith is love dependent. Faith works by love. Amen? So I, I brought these to us first because I want us to see that this is an emphasis. And these are just some. There are more in the New Testament giving us that, that recognition of love. And love isn't, uh, love doesn't say it's okay for you to do whatever. And love isn't permissive in allowing wrong. It, it's talking about the way that we're responding to each other, the attitudes that we have, the actions that we have. In other words, love doesn't say it's okay for abortion to be legal. Love doesn't say that. Love doesn't say that. Love is, I love those people and I love the, uh, everyone involved, but love doesn't make right what is wrong. Amen? Love doesn't make, love wouldn't sit and say, well, I love you, so go ahead and beat me. That's not love. You can, you can love somebody as you say, I'm no longer going to be your punching bag. I'm not going to, to sit here and say uh, that the love of God is making me stay with you so that you can physically abuse me. That's not love. You can love them as you separate yourself to a place of safety and you can keep your attitude right and you can walk in love to them and not hold resentment, not hold unforgiveness and still not put yourself in the position to be beat. Amen. Amen? So a lot of times people say, oh, well, love is just allowing everything. No. Love is, God is love. And, and there will be people who go to judgment because they haven't chosen his way. And he's still love. And people say, well, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? He's, he's given everybody a choice not to go. Amen. His love has provided the, the redemption. His love has provided the salvation. He's not, he's not, it's not his will that any should perish. He's not wanting anyone to go. He wants everyone. But the people who choose to stiffen their neck and rebel and, and go against his will and his ways and go against what is right, they are choosing the, the direction of their destiny. They are choosing. He said, I set before you this day life and death. Choose life. I'm setting life before you. You can choose death if you want to, but I'd rather not have you choose life. I'd rather you choose life. I'd rather you not choose death. I'd rather you choose my ways. Amen? And so when we're talking about love, we see our responsibility, and it's good for us to be able to identify that difference, that, that the love of God isn't just laying down all of my rights or laying down all of my uh, natural protections or you know what I'm talking about with uh, a person who might be in a, a marriage situation and they're being beaten by someone, uh, that it, that you can love them as you exit to a place of safety. Hallelujah. We can love people as we walk out in front of, it's, it's love that's going to compel us to go take that stand and pray for those people who are, are in that decision, the valley of decision. Hallelujah. That's love compelling us. Hallelujah. In, in looking at this, you know, um, recently I had the opportunity, I was traveling with Pastor Caldwell and he was going to be ministering at um, Eagle Mountain on uh, perfected love. And we were talking, uh, he and Sister Jeannie and I were just uh, waiting between airplane flights and uh, had a chance to talk and I just started asking him, tell me how to perfect in love. How do we become perfected? And he said, you've got to practice it. <laughs> practice makes perfect. And, and the first step of that is, uh, is the love of God. In other words, for you to walk in love, it doesn't originate with you. The love isn't, you've got, you, you're not on your own to come up with some love to try to love people with in your own power and in your own ability. It's his love. And what we want to do first then is recognize his love at work in our lives. So let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 
and we want to identify and we want to strengthen ourselves. So we see first now, we've looked and seen our part, our responsibility. We were, we're instructed, we are exhorted, we are, are beseeched to increase in love. And now let's, let's start at, at the first step. How do I increase in love? I start by receiving the love of God. I start by receiving and developing myself in the way he loves me. First John chapter 3 makes this statement that is so important to me. This scripture has meant so much to me through the years because when I first came to the Lord and I received Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, I did not know anything about God. And I, I accepted the truth that had been preached to me that Jesus had died on a cross for me. I accepted the truth that had been preached to me that Jesus paid the price for my sins. So I accepted Jesus. And then I started hearing all these scriptures about God the Father. And I'm like, I'm okay. I'm okay with Jesus. He died for me. I can identify with him. He came to this earth. He became a man. He, he died on the cross for me. I don't know anything about the Father. And as I continued, I realized... I didn't know anything about my father. I, I said to my dad, thankfully I had the privilege of leading my father to the Lord before he died. And uh, in the, the two years he was facing a blood cancer, and in that two years in conversation, when we had gone from the time that I ran away from home until my oldest child was 16, and he and I had not, so that was almost 20 years that I had not spoken to him a word. And so when we restored that relationship, it was just a few years later that he died. But in that restoration, I said to him, I said, Dad, I don't even have a picture with you. I can't find any pictures in, in all of the pictures I have of my childhood. I don't even have a picture of me with you. And, and he said, well, well, sure we do. And he started looking. He couldn't find any either. Uh, the relationship that I had with him was so distant. It was so separated that it affected the way I approached God, the Father, my Heavenly Father. And that's why I accepted Jesus as Lord because of what He'd done for me, because of the love that was expressed in the salvation of Him, Him shedding His blood and laying down His life and dying the death I deserve. That touched my heart. But then He said, I found the scripture where He said, I've come to show you the Father. And I thought, I don't know if I want to see the Father because there was such a rejection in my personal life. And I, I mean, I'm sharing that with you from, from that uh, transparent moment just to let you understand that sometimes we haven't opened our heart to the fullness of what Jesus has actually come to bring us into, which is a relationship with the Father. He said, I've come that you might know the Father. I've come to show you the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen him. I, the whole reason I'm here, I'm the express image. Hebrews 1 says Jesus is the express image of the Father. He is the outshining and the brilliance of the Father. If you've seen Jesus, the whole reason he came was for you to see the Father. And this scripture is one that helped me in that receiving the love of God. And I would have to say, Pastor Larry, I, I concur with that part of your testimony. It was when I received the love of the Father that real maturity started happening in my life. My marriage transformed. Yeah. I mean, marriage was difficult when I had an issue receiving love. I had an issue trusting. I had an issue, and when I received the love of the Father, it affected every area of my life. I mean, I was able to walk in victory in so many places I had been battling as a Christian. And this scripture is one that helped me because I put it in my heart and in my mouth every day. I put it in my eyes. I put it in my ears. I put it in my mouth until it got down in my heart. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. It took me a while of saying that till I believed it. It took me a while of chewing on that till I got the revelation out of that verse. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Hallelujah. Behold, that's an instruction. Look, 
Pay attention. Give your eyes to see the manner, the type, the, the expression of the love of the Father that he's called you his son. Male sons, female sons, we're sons of God, children of God. That's the love of God in its fullness to bring you into a child-father relationship, to make you his own. That's the kind of love that he has demonstrated to us. Not, not, not people who are secondary in the family. He didn't bring us in and make us servants. He brought us in and made us sons. And we serve our father in the family business because we love him and we are all about his business and what he's about. But we don't serve him because we are under a servitude. We serve him because he's our father and we work in the family business with him. Hallelujah. He's called, he's called us sons. He didn't bring us in and give us a lesser than portion of the inheritance. He made us equal sharers, equal in proportion of the inheritance with Jesus. Jesus isn't slighted by that. He's not intimidated. He's not saying, how can you give them the same portion you give me? Jesus is not saying that. Jesus embraced us as brethren. He said it, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. It, 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 he embraced it. He was willing. He didn't say, I'm the son of God. You want me to become the son of man? Ooh. He didn't say that. He said, yes, yeah, I, I'm glad to do that. I'm willing to go become the son of man to redeem my brethren to redeem them. It behooved him. It, he embraced it. It was something he was willing to become our brother to redeem us. Hallelujah. Do you see how religion has twisted that over the years? How religion has made it seem like you're a dirty, rotten worm in the dust of the earth and God's just merciful and he's going to just barely save you and you're going to get into heaven by the skin of your teeth. And that whole attitude about how God is so uh, far and distant and so far above and we are so lowly. But he says he's made us in his image and in his likeness. And then through the redemption of Jesus, although Adam fell through the redemption of Jesus, he has brought us back into the family and restored us to, brought us in and given us a full inheritance equal to the portion Jesus gets. That's love. Amen. Hallelujah. When we were yet sinners, he loved us that way. Hallelujah. So, Looking at this love is the first step to us developing in love. It's, you can't love anybody else if you haven't received the love first. You've got to receive his love and you've got to believe his love and you've got to develop in how he loves you so that you can love others right. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, it tells us about this uh, growing in faith or believing, you could say, about this love. It says, we have known and believed the love that God has to us. Now, if you say that and your heart tells you, I don't know if I believe that, keep saying it till you do. Keep Just pull that scripture out and put it in your mouth and say, I know and I believe the love that God has to me. Meditate on it. Feed on that. I know and I believe the love that God has to me. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God. Now again, we've got to recognize the difference between the emotion of love that our society has twisted. Hello, I love you. Can you tell me your name? 
That's the twisted versions that, that we have floating around our society. All of the carnal love, the emotional love, the, the, the love that is conditional, the love that is changing and, and, and wishy-washy, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the force of love. God is the force of love. He doesn't just have some love. He is love. The essence of his character, the essence of who he is, is the force of the supernatural love. And when this word was used in the New Testament, it was not ever used prior to being written in the New Testament. It was not a word. There are other words for love in the Greek language. Phileo is a word that is talking about uh, uh, brotherly love. Uh, eros is a romantic love. There are other types of words that were used to describe a familial love. Uh, those those other types of love, but this word that was used to describe the God kind of love, it was never used before it was in, written into the New Testament because it was never available before Jesus brought that love on the scene for us. Hallelujah. God is this force of love that is described to us in 1 Corinthians 13 that is demonstrated to us through God sending his son is demonstrated to us through salvation, through redemption. You're going to have to spend time in the word to be able to identify what God's love is and how it is different than human natural feelings of love. And when we recognize we're talking about the force of love, we recognize that it is a spiritual flow. God is also, it also says in the scripture, God is spirit. So God is love. God is spirit. He, the essence of who he is, is this love. And we have to not only know, but we need to bring our faith and we need to believe the love. We know and we believe the love that God has to us. And then when we abide in him, we're abiding in that love. Ephesians 3, 16. This is a Holy Spirit-inspired prayer that many of us pray often over ourselves, over our family. I pray it over you and over the partners of this ministry. Let's read 16 down through 18. This prayer is that he would, that God, he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to look a little bit differently than maybe you do when you're using this in your prayer life. And I want you to look specifically at this subject that we're investigating tonight concerning love. And I want you to see that it says, first of all, in verse 17, that we need to be rooted and grounded in love. And so if I were to take these three scriptures, 16, 17, or I'm sorry, 17, 18, and 19, and identify a process here, I would recognize this is my foundation. That, that before I begin to build anything, the first step is that I get rooted, that I get grounded, that I get established, to become established in this love. And that would begin with me being established in the fact that God loves me. Hallelujah. And I know, I know, we got the Christian bobblehead thing that could go on right there. Yeah, I know God loves me. 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 Yeah, God loves me. 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 But we want to believe. We want to know and believe the love that God has to us. Is that what it said? We know and believe the love that God has to us. That's the foundation. That's the, the establishing. 
Before I build anything else, I need my foundation laid. I need to establish and, and develop and become proficient in my, my confidence, my certainty of the love that God has for me. Hallelujah. And then we see the next step. It says that, it says that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Well, if you are building on a foundation, this, these are the dimensions you're looking at. How, t- how tall is this building going to be? How many floors? How many floors? You're talking about building a building. You're, he's identifying dimensions, breadth, length, depth, height. How many floors, how many rooms, how many walls? Before I get, be, begin building those different compartments of my life, my marriage, my finances, my children, my grandchildren, all of these different areas and compartments of my life, I need my foundation laid, and then I can begin building on that foundation. And he says that when you are rooted and grounded in the love, then you'll be able to comprehend Now, this word comprehend is not just a mental word. It's not just a mental verb. In the original language, it means apprehend or lay hold of, seize upon. When you are rooted and grounded in love, you can lay hold of, you can seize upon the breadth and length and depth and height. This is our growth. This is our developing. So it's not just mental of understanding, because we think comprehend is understand. But this word in the original language is talking about bringing it into manifestation in my life. It's laying a hold of it. It's putting my hands on it and bringing it into possession in my life. When I'm rooted and grounded in love, I will be able to lay hold of the dimensions of the love that are going to help me build these areas of my life. Verse 19 says, And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. How do you know something that passes knowledge? Does that seem like a misnomer in its statement? It's for you to know something that passes knowledge. In the original language, it's saying for you to know by first-hand experience something that goes beyond mere head knowledge. For you to know by first-hand experience, when when you've experienced the love of God, it's different than somebody just telling you about the love of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. For you to know first-hand experience, something that goes beyond, that surpasses just the mere head knowledge of it. How How do I apprehend this? How do I seize upon this? How do I bring that into manifestation? I I start with being rooted and grounded in love. Then I grow and I develop in that love so that I can know what is the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And then I want to know, experiencing for myself, firsthand experience, this love that passes just mere head knowledge so that I may be filled with the fullness. This is what God wants every one of us to achieve. He wants every one of his children filled with his fullness. Jesus is the head, the fullness of him. who He, he is the one who fills all in all. The church is the fullness of the one uh, who fills all in all. He wants us to be filled with his fullness. How? Love is the key. Love growing and developing and maturing in the love of God for me and through me is the key to being filled with the fullness of God. And God is love, so we're talking about being filled with the fullness of love. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. And let's read verse 35. So we first of all looked at, we've be, we, we have, have given our attention to, to behold the love that God has for us in Christ. We have 
allowed that love to go through a process of laying a foundation so that we're rooted and grounded in the love of God. We are letting it grow in our life until we see the dimensions of God's love at work in our, our compartments of life, the different areas of our life. We're, we're, we're walking in love while we're driving down the highway. Can I get a witness in the house? Got some love on the highway? <laughs> Hallelujah. Walking in love on the job. Walking in love with, with, with your in-laws and walking in love with... With uh, yeah, we're 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 most importantly walking in love with brothers and sisters in Christ, yeah. Hallelujah, and then we come to a place of certainty, and that's what we're going to see here in this verse. It asks a question in verse thirty-five: Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us? Are there things trying to separate people from the love of Christ? All the time, all the time trying to convince people that God doesn't love them. Something will happen in their family or something will happen because of, of the curse that's operative in the world, because of negligence on somebody's part, because of whatever reason something might happen and people say, why did God let that happen? God did that. Why did God take that child from that young family? Why did God, why did God, why did God... And, and putting all that blame, that's all designed to separate people from the love of God. That's designed to separate them from, from trusting Him and receiving from Him. Who shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Those are all difficult things. Those are all, all things that none of us would, would, would sign up for willingly. Yeah, give me that one. Give me that tribulation one. Give me that distress one. I want that one tomorrow. No, none of us. But if we're walking through an area, that's the most important time that I need the love. Love is going to see me through. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then verse 36 throws people in the wrong direction because they read it as though it is an answer to verse 35. For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, he's, he's talking about a verse that has been taken out of context for them. He says, what shall separate us? Shall these difficult things separate us? You know, it was written, and people took it to mean, for your sake we're killed all the day long. And then verse 37, he answers that. No, no, no. That's not our attitude. For your sake we're killed all the day long. Oh, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world of woe no 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 i'm coming up on the rough side Chapter and verse for that rough side. I want to find the chapter and the verse for that rough side of the mountain. No. Listen to, the, listen to the Holy Spirit. He says, no. No. In all these things, in tri tribulation, in perils, in distress, in nakedness, in sword, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. We're conquerors because of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We're conquerors because we're rooted and grounded in love. And if I'm rooted and grounded, you're not moving me away from God. If I'm rooted and grounded in love, I'm not being moved by the circumstance or the situation or the bad attitudes or the wrong treatment. In the, in the middle of that, I've got a root system dug down deep. Hey, God loves me. God loves me. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse 38, for I am persuaded. That's where we are. 
The question, who shall separate us? Let me tell you, no, nobody. I'm persuaded. I am persuaded. Now, when you have developed in the love, that's what you're going to come to. That's the level you're going to achieve. You're going to become persuaded in the love of God. Persuaded. You're going to be rooted and grounded. You're going to begin to experience and to know the dimensions, the height, the depth, the width, and the breadth of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You're going to know for firsthand experience, and then you're going to become persuaded, persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers and things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love. Why? Because we're connected. We're rooted and grounded into it. It's a, he is a part of our life. I dwell in love. I dwell in God. God dwells in me. Love dwells in me. I dwell in love, I dwell in God, God dwells in me, love dwells in me. You can't separate me from him. Why? Because his love is in my heart. And as long as his love is in my heart, he's in my heart. As long as he's in my heart, his love is in my heart. None of these things. He was, he was covering the gamut. He just went through all of the things, things present, things to come, height, depth, and that's from the highest point to the lowest point. Let's just cover it all. Nothing can separate us. None of these things. None of these difficulties. No adversity. Nothing that comes against is capable of separating you from the love of God. Nobody can stop God from loving you. And nobody can stop you from receiving the love that God has for you. And living in that love. Do you see the victory in this love? In this being established in the love of God. Hallelujah. This love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now back up to chapter 5. And, and I want every believer to know verse 5 of this chapter. Romans 5, 5 says, Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. One translation says, dispersed in abundance. The, holy, the love of God is dispersed in abundance in our heart. Dispersed in abundance. And my favorite translation would be the Weiss translation of this verse. It says, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts, and still floods them. The love of God still floods our hearts through the agency of the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love has been poured out and still floods. Because the original verb in the language uh, that it was written, the original verb has a connotation of a continual action. It's not something that just happened one time. It happened and it continues to work. It was poured out and is continually poured out to the, to the point that it's flooding our heart. An immersion of the love of God. That is available whether you feel it or not. We, uh, we, we bring our faith to this, right? Is that in your scripture? Is that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart? Is that in your, your verse? In your Bible? So... Even if you think, well, I don't feel like I'm loved. Feeling is not how we find it. We, it's not an indicator of whether it's there or not. The Word says it's there. It's there. It's immersed. You're flooded with love right now. Right now, in this very moment, the love of God is flooding your heart. Amen. I mean, you are at the overflow of the love of God in your heart right now. Now you have to yield to that. So that means... The love is always available, even when I'm ready to pull somebody's hair. <laughs> if I'm pulling hair, it's because I haven't yielded to the love, whether it's my hair or theirs. It's because I haven't yielded to the love that is in abundance available, flooded in my heart. And so that means every time that you think I need to get the last word in, stop and say, wait, there's a flood for me. I'm going to access what's in the flood. I'm just going to dip down into that flood and let that flood of the love of God answer that. 
so that I don't say something I'm going to have to repent for or act in a way that I'm going to have to ask them to forgive me about it. And <laughs> the love is abundant in our heart. Hallelujah. This love is available. Now, I'm using that in a way that we deal with each other, that we deal with people in our life. But think about this. This love of God, he's talking about you and God. He's talking about the fact that you, it, it, it starts out by saying uh, we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. We have access to stand in the grace, the favor of God. And we stand in that favor and we rejoice in the hope of the glory. So now, now we know what hope he was talking about, the hope of the glory. Well, the glory is not when you go to heaven, the glory land. The glory, you have this treasure in your earthen vessel. The glory is the life of God in you, the glory of God in you now. His glory, and we're going from glory to glory. So the, the glory level that is present in you now, He wants you to grow in that. Amen. Amen? And so this expectation, this hope of glory, He said, this hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God's poured out in your heart, shed abroad in your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So in other words, you're never hoping in vain. You're never, you're never expecting for nothing. You're never desiring to grow in God and desiring to walk in His will and desiring to fulfill His plan for your life and going to come up short and say, well, uh, it, was, it was hopeless. I, I, it, I'm disappointed now. No, if you'll access and yield to the love, you'll walk in the fullness of His plan for your life. If you'll access and yield to the love, you'll walk in His holiness. You'll walk in His wisdom. You'll walk in His favor. You'll walk in... Why? Because love is the, su the power supply of all, uh, of, 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 uh, all that He has. It, God is love. Hallelujah. So He says, hope, hope will never make you ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. You always have a full supply. You always have a full supply of love. Hallelujah. Let's go back to 1 John, and we'll wrap it up here in 1 John. And I, I have a couple of them here, and, and you know, the time changed, and so my, the clock that I have, it, it says I got a long time yet to preach uh, because we haven't changed it. I moved it all the way over there so it wouldn't deceive me. Hallelujah. And... Thank you for being hungry for the word. First John chapter 2. We're growing. Can you, you can just, we're just growing in love tonight. First John chapter 2. Let's look at verse 5. I want to, this final step here is developing in the word by keep, keeping the word develops the love. Keeping the word of God is how we develop in love. First John chapter 2 verse 5. Whoso keepeth his word. In him verily is the love of God perfected, matured, completed. Hereby we know that we are in him. So keeping the word is the way to grow in the love of God. Keeping the word is the way to grow in the love of God. Well, what word do I keep? What word is the Holy Spirit bringing to your understanding? If you are needing to be patient... He may be bringing be patient with all men. If you need to have uh, the love of God at work in your attitudes towards others, he may say, blessed is he who does not sit in the seat of the scornful. Hallelujah. If it is, you know, whatever it may be, he'll bring it to you. You'll, you'll understand, wait a minute, I, I'm, I'm supposed to walk in love there. So keeping the word is a way, and so start where you are, you know, walking in, in uh, how about just being joyful, isn't, isn't that a word that applies to every one of us every day, just being joyful, you know, when you're being joyful, everybody around you appreciates it, Amen. everybody around you will appreciate much more a joyful attitude than if you are a sourpuss, <laughs> walking around grumbly, and <laughs> That's hard to live with. <laughs> and so you're walking in love just by being joyful. 
just by saying the joy of the Lord is my strength. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. You're walking in love. Just walking in that joy. Amen. So keeping the word. And then chapter 4 verse 7. 1 John 4 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and His love is perfected in us. It says, no man has seen God at any time, but if you are walking in love, if you're walking in love, they're seeing God in you. You haven't seen him with your natural eyes, but if you've seen somebody walking in love, you've seen God in them. Hallelujah. So, again, acting on the word, walking in love. His love is perfected in us. Again, we see this importance of love coming to a place of completeness. Love growing. The Amplified, actually, I think it's the Amplified that uses that verse. It says, brought to completion. It is perfected or made perfect or brought to completion. Hallelujah. Show me verse 12 in the Amplified if you can make it work for you this time. Just dominate that. Say, listen here, Amplified. You obey me. Look, see, she did it. Hallelujah. No man has at any time yet seen God, but if we love one another, God abides, lives, and remains in us, and his love that love which is essentially his is brought to completion, to its full maturity, run its full course. It is perfected in us. Hallelujah. That's what we want. Every one of us wants to increase in this maturity of love. Hallelujah. And then finally, this same chapter, verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. Again, that word mature. Herein is our love brought to maturity, completion, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Or you could say, this is why we need to have our love brought to maturity. This is why we need to have our love brought to completeness. So that on that day of judgment, we're going to stand before him with a boldness. Hey, I'm good. I've been walking in love. I'm good. <laughs> No, I'm not intimidated. I'm not worried about it. I'm good. I'm confident. I, I'm, I'm, hey, praise the Lord. I, everything's good. I've been walking in love. Amen? Not of, oh, man, I need to, I got to deal with this. I need to go ask this person. I need to walk in love here. And oh, my gosh, it's the day of judgment. I don't have time to make all these wrongs right. Oh, Lord, forgive me. No, we can just, just live in that place where we're, the moment we've met, stepped out of love, we get back in love. We repent of it, we get back over in love, and then we're always confident, always have a boldness in His presence. Yes, sir, I've been walking in love. Yes, sir, my love walks good. I've obeyed you and everything where that was concerned, and I repented, and not, have, not, not saying I've never made a mistake, but every time I did, I acted back on the word and got in line with the love of God. Amen? This is why we need to have our love made complete or brought to a place of maturity so that we can have boldness in the day of judgment. We, none of us want to stand on the day of judgment and say, I have not been walking in love. I have not been excelling in the love walk. I have not been abounding in love. Hallelujah. And then it says, because as he is. Well, verse 16 told us what, how he is. God is love. As he is. How is he? He's love. As he is, so are we. We are the love of God in this world. We are the love of God in this world. 
we are the containers, the expression of God's love to the people who are walking in darkness, the people who don't know Him, the people who need to be saved. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so the maturing, this perfecting, this, this growth is something that every one of us have a responsibility to. Every one of us have a love walk to work on. And every one of us are in different stages of growth and maturity where it's concerned. And love keeps us from looking and saying, Whoo, your love walk, you need that CD, brother. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Behold, look at, give attention to this manner of love that he's called us the sons of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. I just want you to pray this with me, if you would. Would you just open up your heart to the Lord right now and say, Father, I receive this word tonight as an instruction for my life. I desire to grow, to mature, and develop in your love for me and my love towards the brothers. I want to be skilled in the love walk, abounding in love, increasing in love, being as you are, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's a light to live by, family. That's a light to live by. Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet as we prepare to dismiss this evening. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Lord is good. Did you receive from the Word tonight? Amen. Praise God. Well, I want to remind you uh, that we uh, have Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, Next Sunday, Pastor Steele will be here, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and we are building faith and framing worlds. Let's declare our vision together, okay? The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. You and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.